so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jordan. Thank you. Yes. So I am here now to introduce our second facilitator, Professor Kofi Asari Apuku. He is a professor of African philosophy, ethics, and religion at the African University College of Communications, educated at the University of Ghana, Yale University, and the University of Bonn in West Germany. He has taught in several universities around the world and is the author of a number of books, including Speak to the Winds, Proverbs from Africa, and Hearing and Keeping African Proverbs. He is a pioneer member of the Academic Council of the Pan-African Heritage Museum in Ghana, and he also serves as advisor to the curatorial board of the museum. Please welcome. Professor, Professor. Yeah. thank you. Incredible and distinguished leaders. Uh, Prof is 90 years old, an incredibly, you know, man, full of incredible wisdom. And uh, he's such a gift to the world. And what a class we're going to have. He's going to be leading us. We're coming towards the end on African wisdom and leadership. And I'm not supposed to say that, but let me say this. When you sit with Prof and you look at his skin, his skin looks like that of a baby. He's got incredible secrets that he might be able to share with us. He simply looks like, like you know, he's 17, 20 years. What a gift he is. All right, over to Prof. And uh, I think we'll let Dr. Jordan start again, please, with some questions. All righty. Prof, you have traveled and lectured in the U.S. and around the world. Can you please tell us about some of the places and countries where you have lectured and share with us the five African proverbs you normally start your lectures with? Thank you very much. I have traveled throughout the world teaching, lecturing about Africa. I've been to China, Korea, Japan, Sri Lanka, India, Philippines, United States, Canada, you know, so many, so many countries. And all I teach about is Africa because I want people to know the wisdom, the deep wisdom that Africa has that seems to have been overshadowed by what people tend to call modernity. Whenever I have taught a course outside of Ghana or of Africa, I have used five African proverbs on the first day of the lecture. And we come back to these lectures, um, these um, proverbs on the last day of the class. The first proverb says, one must come out of one's house to begin learning. All learning is like taking steps away from your familiar surroundings. And so as children, after they have been further trained, are sent to kindergartens or preschool, and the experience of taking steps away from their homes sets into motion a process of learning. So all learning is like taking steps away from our familiar surroundings. The second proverb that I use, is the proverb that says, if you have not been outside of your home or house, you do not say that your mother's soup is the best. Most people have never left their countries or their religious communities, and yet they speak authoritatively and even in superlative terms about having the best. This proverb doesn't encourage you to put down your mother's cooking. It's merely suggesting that if you are to speak about your mother's cooking in the superlative, at least you must have had the experience of tasting other soups. The third proverb is a proverb about truth, wisdom or knowledge. Truth is like a baobab tree. One person's arms cannot embrace it. In other words, there's no single culture, single religion that exhausts the meaning of truth. If we are to succeed in surrounding the Baobab tree of truth, wisdom, or knowledge, 
we virtually have to hold hands in order to surround the Baobab tree of truth, wisdom, or knowledge. And, and our ancestors in the Shona people have said already centuries ago that the wise person does not say that he or she has the final word, but the fool insists. And the fool may be waving a sacred book or whatever, Okay, according to the wisdom of our ancestors in Africa, there is no final word. There is no final truth. The fourth proverb is a proverb about the human body. And, and in Africa, in African cultures, you see the human body is full of lessons, thousands of lessons from our bodies, from which we learn lessons to apply to our lives in society. Uh, the one proverb that comes to mind readily is the proverb that says when the right hand washes the left and the left hand washes the right, then both hands are clean. It sounds very simple, but it has a profound hidden meaning. The right hand, however long or big, cannot wash itself. And the left arm, however long or big, cannot wash itself. If the right hand is to become clean, the left has to do it for it, and if the Right, left hand has to do with the right has to do with. From this, our ancestors learned that every human being has a limitation. And the way to overcome limitation is to come together. And that way you eliminate limitations. The proverb about the eye says, however big one eye may be, two are better. Because we have two eyes, we see better. We have binocular vision. If we had only one eye, the world would look different. And the last proverb is about hunting. And it says, hunt in every forest. For there is wisdom and good hunting in all of them. You know, I live in the tropical forest. I can find myself in the desert and throw up my arms and say, what hunting can I do here? Well. This proverb is suggesting that even the desert has its own unique hunting experiences. Now, all these proverbs put together, you know, encourage the going out, tasting other stoops, right? holding hands to, so, so, um, to surround the Baba tree of truth, um, developing a second eye so we can see better, and being intellectually adventurous and looking everywhere. Looking everywhere does not mean you don't have confidence in your own. On the contrary, by looking everywhere, you learn more about your own. So if we can adopt these problems as a way of looking at the world, instead of the narrow-mindedness that has you know, truncated everything, the world would be a better place. And this is wisdom from Africa, the home of humankind. This is where all humans began. And everything that we have today has its origin in Africa. It's the newcomers who claim to have created everything. But, I mean, the proverb says, before the blacksmith brought his razor, the vulture and the guinea fowl shaved their heads. Africa is the beginning of human culture, human civilization. Incredible wisdom. Well, before the blacksmith made its razor, the vulture had already shaved his head. Well, and so before people discovered America, well, people were already living there. So who claims to have been discovered? Well, Prof, thank you so much. Um, across Africa, we see roundness in our architecture. Buildings are round and many roundness in our concepts. Please, is there any meaning to the roundness in African architecture? Yeah, you see, for our ancestors in Africa, the circle, the symbol of the universe is or was the circle. Now, the circle represents unendingness. The circle has no beginning, has no end. The circle is the symbol of, of security. And so understanding the universe, symbolized by the circle, our ancestors decided that when they were going to build a dwelling house or homes to live in, they created the universe 
and place themselves at the center of it. And so the roundhouses that Africa has, has a philosophical underpinning, you know? And that means the, our ancestors created the universe and placed themselves at the center of it. This is the reason why you find roundhouses in Africa, you know? And this symbol of the universe is actually the reality because there are, no, there are no rectangles in the universe. Everything is round or there are no squares, you know. And this roundness, roundness influenced traditional African architecture. Of course, it's interesting to, to note that when the European missionaries came to Africa, they spoke against round houses. <laughs> they wanted Africans to build rectangular houses without knowing that there is a profound philosophical basis for the round houses that Africans built. And so even when Africans went across the oceans to the Western Hemisphere, the circle prevailed. I mean, if you go to Haiti today and you see the Ungan, the, 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 um, the voodoo priest performing, well, he first creates a circle with cornflower and stands in the, in the middle of it, okay? And when you come to, to there are some areas in Mexico where roundhouses were found. Well, all these people came from Africa. But unfortunately, the roundhouse architecture may not be taught in many architectural schools in Africa. They start with the European concepts and miss a lot. So this idea that the universe is round and is symbolized by a circle is very important. It even um, influences our way, the way in which we look at life. life Life is, is endless, life is indestructible, indestructible, and life is, goes in a circle, you know, life enters through birth and exits through, through um, death and renews itself. So in the circle, there is also renewal. Your blood circulates in your body, but there is always renewal in each circulation of your of your of, of, of the blood in your system. So the circle is, is a very important symbol of the universe. Amazing, amazing, thank you. Wow, wow, thank you so much for sharing such wisdom with us today. What a blessing this is. Uh, my next question is how can Africans and people of African descent in the diaspora restore or have more confidence or restore their sense of enoughness? Well, it is worthy of note that when especially, especially Europeans, Westerners came to Africa, they resolved that they would only project a very negative, image of Africa. And so they wrote books and produced uh, documents to back up their own prejudices. And of course, over the centuries, you know, um, this negativity affected or influenced many Africans to give them the impression of themselves as people who are not enough, you know. Um, when the Christians came, they described Africans as enemies of Christ, people who are practicing Christicism or whatever. And so, and then of course, when the schools came, they, they used the schools to, to, to project Western negative views about Africa. But Africans must know that they were the originators, original human beings on this earth, okay? And that, um, Everything that we have today has its origin here. And Africans must also know that they don't have to depend on external Western views of themselves. They have to know that they come from um, a profound culture. There's a proverb from the Congo that says, the person who is in touch with his origins is a person who will never die. And we have origins that go back into antiquity, 
and Africa is not the dark continent that the Europeans insist on painting it. The darkness is in the minds of the Europeans, not in Africa, okay? And so we have to note that even, for instance, our concept of a human person, I mean, I'll give you the Akan example, you know, every Akan believes that he, he, he or she is part of the substance of a body of the creator. He's, he's not an image of the creator as uh, Christians, uh, scriptures and theologians would insist that a human being was created in the image of God. For us, the Akan, for instance, you know, we, a human being has an okra, and the okra is the very part of the substance of God, of the creator. So if the creator is in you, you, you cannot. It's only ignorance that makes you bow to others who tell you that because you are a black skin or something, you are inferior. No, you have God in you, your very being. You are like the... The, the, the wave and the ocean, you are part, a drop of ocean water is part of the ocean. And the, the okra is part of the ocean of Odumankuma. So you are God. And because you are God, we have a saying in the Akan, you know, I will die only if God dies, the creator does not die. And so you do not die. That is why we call libation to our ancestors. We don't talk to people who are dead. We, we talk to them because they are alive. And I would use a modern example from physics, quantum physics, so you modernists can understand that this whole universe is nothing but a giant field of energy. And energy takes on different forms and energy is never destroyed. Well, the energy of our ancestors was never destroyed. That's why we talk to them. And then we, these people come and tell us, Oh, you are practicing paganism or fetishism when you talk to the dead. We're not talking to the dead. We're talking to people who are alive. And in fact, when you look at our traditional understanding of, of life and death, life has, no, um, li life has no end. Life is indestructible. What is opposite is birth and death. Okay, death, birth is the entry gate. Death, the exit gate through which life passes to renew itself. So in the African concept, there's no death. What dies is the external skin. We call the human, the human being in the Akan okra as, as, um, an okra, a spirit that is having a human experience. That is all you are. When you die, it doesn't end your life. And if you look at our languages, for instance, the Akan language, you know, when a person dies, they see the verb that is used is see. When you see something, it means it is retrievable. You can get it back. It's not lost. So we have to make study our own traditions and teach the world the meaning of life and not the way we have allowed ourselves simply out of ignorance to let others tell us who we are and interpret the meaning of life to us. Because our ancestors understood life and they understood life so deeply the problem is that those of us who came after our ancestors and went to school and, and then converted to other religions, you know, have tended to completely ignore this gold mine. And this truth is yet to come out. Of course, no matter how much indoctrination has taken place in Africa, I go by the problem of our ancestors, the Maasai, who said the scorching sun cannot erase the stripes of the zebra. There is there's so many things left for us to use as our stepping stones, our climbing ladders, to bring out the wisdom and, and, and especially the deep wisdom that Africa possesses. Well, well, the scorching sun, no matter how hot it is, can never erase the stripes of the zebra. What wisdom, Prof. Incredible, incredible words and executive students. This is an executive leadership class. You want to open your minds and up for wisdom. Prof, once in the United States, you were asked a very, very condescending question. You were with a group of um, Caucasians and someone asked you, so you, as an African, what can you teach a Westerner? What was your answer to that question at that time? And how would you answer that if you were asked again 
today as an oh, African, okay. you have anything to offer or to teach a Westerner? Yes. I, I, I faced many challenging questions while I was in the US, but one of the questions that st stands out is what you have just mentioned. I want to speak in a Presbyterian church in Fairfield, Connecticut. You know, I was in a seminary and uh, most of my classmates were, did field work in various churches weekends. And so a friend of mine invited me to this Presbyterian church and a man from New York asked me the question, sir, what can the African teach the American? I was stunned that anybody would ask me such a question. So I always um, call on my ancestors. I walk with them. My ancestors are with me. I quickly said, ancestors tell me what to tell them. And all I heard myself saying was, however good a teacher you may be, you cannot teach a student who is not prepared to learn. No matter how good a teacher you are, it is the preparedness of the student to learn that enables you to teach him. And so I said, if the Americans are prepared to learn from Africans, they will have a host of things to learn from them. And then I, I, I gave them some examples. I said, if you look into the mirror admiring your face, you do not know that the mirror was invented by the ancient Egyptians 300 years before Christ, who has been made a European by the Europeans. Okay? Now, if you switched on your electric uh, light, well, what is electricity but fire? We have in Ghana our own history of how fire came into the world. The Akan people have eight uh, matrilineal clans, and one group, the Aduana people, are the originators of fire. I mean, and there's a story of how fire came into the world. A dog grinding his teeth set up this fire, and so we have the image of a dog with fire coming out of its mouth. So electricity is nothing but fire. Who first invented fire? Well, we have our own story as to how fire first came into the world. If you woke up wearing your pajamas, I told this man, well, pajamas didn't come from, um, from Germany or any part of Europe, pajamas came from Burma. And I gave him so many examples and I ended my answer to him by saying, those who know the origin of human culture and civilization are very humble about it. But those who don't stand on rooftops and challenge the very people who put up the structure on top of which they stand to pose their questions. And so the room was full of applause, but I told them, well, human culture and civilization are very interdependent. And so we cannot claim that um, we invented everything as some cultures have said, you know, we have all learned from each other. Human civilizations are built on the foundations of others. If you take the modern telephone, for instance, the telephone would never have been invented if the people who came up with the talking drums never created the talking drums because the first telephone in the world was created by the people who made the talking drums because they faced the challenge of, of having their voices carry beyond their physical location. And they knew even then that sound travels faster than the human voice. And so they came up with two drums and the inside was made rough to prevent vibration. And then they found some animal skin to cover the drum. And they had some eggs and drumsticks to communicate a message. And believe it or not, a message sent by the talking drum can travel a distance of 4,000 kilometers in one hour. This was the beginning of telephone. And these telephones that have become so common would not have come into being if the talking drums had not been made. So one can see how indebted the whole world is to the beginnings of what we have today. 
Oh my goodness. Mm. Wow. Wow. Oh gosh. Um, please tell us about Anansi Akura, the 30 acre orchard and herbarium you have created in Ghana. Yes, I have two places in Ghana in the mountains of Akwapim in the eastern region, about 35 miles northeast of Accra. The first is called Anansi Akra, the spider's village. This is a three-acre piece of land. And on this piece of land, I have a number of fruits as well as medicinal plants. I decided that I was a student and a teacher of African studies, African culture. But that because our ancestors could not define themselves in isolation from the earth, environment, I decided to make my teaching real by having a concrete place, a forest, a herbarium where people can see and learn the number of medicinal plants that our ancestors used. And it is a place where people come and learn about plant medicine, you know, that our ancestors used. And I also have a number of fruits and so forth. I have turmeric from Zanzibar. Uh, from Zanzibar. I have, I have, um, I have even got some avocados from America. So many, and I have some baobab trees from Senegal. And I teach people about all these. Well, let me give you a quick example. The baobab tree, the water, the baobab tree is a fire resistant tree. And the water in the baobab tree has tannic acid, which our ancestors used in converting rawhide into leather. And the bark of the baobab tree, when it's dry and it's burnt, it produces um, potash for making soap. And our ancestors had all this vast knowledge about so many of these plants, okay? So that is an ancipra. And then I have about a 36 acre dense tropical forest that I call Anansi Kwai, the spider's forest. And in this forest, there are so many different plants, uh, trees, and so forth. And there are some animals, you know, antelopes and tortoises and, and, uh, and, um, and um, you know, frogs and, and spiders and butterflies. And even the stream in the river has some mudfish and so on. And I, I'm keeping these forests because we're losing our forests in Ghana. And my sole purpose in creating this at my own expense is that posterity children in the, of the future may come and find what a tropical forest looks like. Because um, lamentably in, in, the, in about the next 20 years or so, Ghana will be full of houses because we think that the only value of land is to build a house upon it. But the value of the forest, both Anansipra and Anansipai, is immeasurable. And I want posterity to come and see what a forest looks like and learn the value of forest. And through that, maybe they will go out and recreate forests um, elsewhere in Ghana, because that's what we need. We need to live in harmony with our environment and what we are destroying in our time by building houses and so on in the name of an elusive development is what we're actually destroying is what some people, our ancestors, uh, protected, you know, for us. And what we are destroying is what they left behind. And if we don't take care, well, the next generation will not come to find anything. They'll come to find a dry and barren environment, which will threaten their very lives. Because if our forests disappear, we must know that our lives disappear because the oxygen we need to live on to survive is, is produced by the trees. And if we build all over, besides for our ancestors, you see, uh, the forest was a source of knowledge, a source of wisdom. If the forest disappeared, what stories are we going to tell about skyscrapers or planes and, and, and motor cars? No, nature is our best teacher. And if we, we, we preserve nature, we are preserving ourselves. 
the idea of sustainability that has become fashionable, our ancestors knew this, it's already built into their life. When our fishermen go fishing, you know, before they come back home, they always throw back into the ocean a small amount of the live fish. The idea is you take out and you replace. You take out and you replace. That is sustainability. But that was built into our culture. We didn't have to learn this from Europe. So the idea of sustainability is now in vogue as if it's a new thing. No, our ancestors knew this centuries ago. That's why the environment uh, was preserved until we, it came to our time when we are destroying it recklessly. You know, so our ancestors, in most respects, were much wiser and more thoughtful than we are because in this generation we are only you know followers for copying what others introduce but our ancestors um, left us with a lot of wisdom and they said you know borrowed water never quenches thirst you know so yeah, there you go All right, leaders, um, we're going to have the privilege for those of you coming for the mission in Ghana in the month of January. We, we're going to have that rare privilege of visiting the Spiders Village. And uh, I tell you, this is probably the wisest man I have ever met. And there are not many 90-year-olds in Kredby, wise men, that you get to give you such tremendous grounding about the continent of Africa. Well, because of time, I'm going to ask Dr. Jordan to kindly do the final question, and then we can open the floor for some further questions. All righty. Professor, please tell us a story that sums up your key advice to our poly leaders. Well, let me proceed that by saying that um, Kofi was describing me as a wise person and so forth. Well, I, I get the, the credit is from our ancestors. It's not me. How would I know all that I know if I did not been for our ancestors? So I remember when I was teaching in the States, people said, oh, we love your proverbs. And I would tell them, oh, no, they're not mine. <laughs> How would I know? This is from... My ancestors, thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, but they said that when a human being dies, his or her tongue does not rot. So it means what a person says survive his physical death, you know. And so um, I, I go by what um, I'm following our ancestors. I consider myself as a student. There's so much to learn from them. If only we would open our eyes and ears, you know, and listen to them, you know. But I would, you know, for, for the leaders of this, um, of this institution, I, I would rather leave you with a few thought-provoking proverbs, you know, for you. We say about leadership, if you're going to be leaders, our ancestors said, um, an army of sheep hmm, led by a lion can defeat an army of lions led by a sheep. This is a profound problem about leadership in Africa. They also said, if you, if you say you are a leader and you have nobody following you, you're only going for a walk, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and um, to, to remind us of, of the value of what we have, but which ignorance has prevented us from knowing because we have so much, we have so much wealth, we have everything that everybody, every any human being would want to have, we have it in abundance in Africa. But because of ignorance, we are, we are going hungry and we are going begging. They said that ignorance makes the chicken go to sleep on an empty stomach standing on a bag of corn. The chicken doesn't know that he it is standing on a bag of corn. And we don't know the value of what we have. And we're borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. But our ancestors said, borrowed water never quenches thirst. Okay? And they said, we do not borrow someone else's teeth to smile 
smile with your own teeth. It is important for leaders to know what we have, that we have so much, but our first recourse in most instances is to look outside, but what you're looking for is already inside you. That's why the spider Anansi became such a big um, hero in our folk stories, because unlike the birds who, when they want to build their nest, go and gather twigs and grass and so on, when Anansi wants, the spider wants to build his house, he doesn't go anywhere. From inside the spider comes his house, his playground, his trap. Isn't that amazing? The spider became a, a symbol or a metaphor, really, because it meant that whatever we need, you know, is inside here, it's not out there. So leaders must know that Africa can only survive or progress through its own ideas and values. And that's what everybody has done, okay? We say that before a blind person can throw a stone at you, he must be standing on a stone. We need a foundation. And we must do the work of writing and promoting Africa because our ancestors said, until the lions have their historians, tales of hunting will always glorify the hunter. Look at all the books that they have written about us, at our top, to put us at a disadvantage because they are writing about us to glorify themselves and put us down. So there's a responsibility for leaders also to be aware of this and speak from within instead of speaking from without and giving the impression that there is nothing here. This is a barren desert. This is the most fertile soil on earth on which you can grow anything and we must know this. And so with this um, knowledge, I'm sure that leaders in this institution will begin to look at themselves afresh and know that um, we are the, as our ancestors said, the offspring of an elephant will never be a dwarf. Our ancestors were great people. And those who came after them are supposed to be elephants, not dwarfs. Start innovation, people. Start innovation. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Well, oh my goodness. This is well. Get your questions ready because we don't have much time. Um, wow, wow. Whatever we need is inside of us. And Dr. Jordan, please do not borrow someone else's teeth to smile. Kindly smile with your own teeth. Wow. Well, that's incredible. Dr. Jordan, any remarks from you? And then the, the floor is open for quick questions. And then uh, we go to Mr. Arjun. I, I am just over overwhelmed. Um, wow, just the, knowing our own history, knowing our, the lessons from our ancestors, knowing who we are and where we came from and all of the beginnings that are in Africa. It, it just absolutely amazing knowing that would have to change in the way you see yourself. If you don't see yourself right, right now, knowing that will change the way you see yourself. What a powerful message, um, profound wisdom, incredible experience shared in those words. Just, uh, my heart is just overwhelmed, just overwhelmed. Thank you so much, Professor, wonderful. Wonderful, incredible. I we can't I can't put it into words. Just absolutely amazing. Thank you so much. Well, my favorite is still no matter how hot the scorching sun is, it can never ban the stripes on the zebra. And to remember that we are zebras and we cannot let anything, you know, defeat us and nothing can change us. Well, that's like my biggest takeaway. Oh, our distinguished leaders, let's go all over back here to Ghana. He is a human resource manager, and um, he is um, he is based in the western region of Ghana in the person of Mr. Ajin, a senior human resource manager, and he's going to lead the whole village to say a huge thank you to Prof. 
Over to you, Mr. Arjun, please. Do you want to mute yourself, sir? Oh, okay. Um, Mr. Michael, I think I think your your audio isn't fully in it. I think your audio isn't fully activated. Um, and so let me let me let me just ask um, yeah. Let me just ask a volunteer to do that for us tonight. Um, let me ask one of our senior volunteers to do that tonight. I see Mr. Arjun is here. But we don't have time, so we're not going to wait for you, sir. Let me ask one of our senior volunteers to do that for us. Hey, Vice Marshal, do you want to step in? Or oh, His Royal Highness, any of you, please. AVM, do you want to step in for us? Yes, sir. Thank you. Please do us the honors and help us. Send thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, Dr. Kofi, Dr. Ola, thank you for this opportunity. On, uh, and um, should, okay, I think Michael is back. Michael, are you here? I, I think his sound is not active, so ki kindly proceed. Okay, I, I really want to thank our esteemed professor for the time you've shared with us and it's just so amazing um, knowing your age, how strong your voice is and how very articulate your um, responses were. And of course, like our esteemed faculty have said, um, it's just so amazing learning from you and knowing how rich our culture is and how um, the knowledge of our history and our origins helps to helps us to better see ourselves. So on behalf of my fellow participants and esteemed leaders, I sincerely want to thank you for finding time to share your knowledge with us and for inspiring us with this precious wisdom that can only be gotten from Africa. And uh, my only request is that once the Institute calls on you again, that you will always oblige. And of course, for those of us coming to Ghana, we're looking forward to seeing you in person. So once again, thank you very much. And God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Kofi. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. You would always get the military commander saving the day for us. Thank you so much. Dr. Jordan, you do have the final words. Please throw one more appreciation to our, our emeritus prop for us. And then announcements regarding next week's team's presentations. Yes, yes. Um, we, we can't thank you enough, Prophet. Just amazing what you have shared with us in this very short time frame, such wisdom. It, it has touched our hearts, it has gone through our spirits, and it, it has enraged our minds. So thank you so much, and I'm so looking forward to meeting you in person in Ghana.